I'm just going to stand here for a moment as my own standing ovation <laughs> to all the women who've come before me and those who will follow. And I mean that literally and spiritually. I'm in awe of you all. But let me tell you a little bit about what I mean. At about the age of 10, I gave up on Sleeping Beauty and Cinderella and started reading biographies. The ones I liked best were the stories of women like Jane Addams, Florence Nightingale, Eleanor Roosevelt. I didn't think of them then as social entrepreneurs, but that's what they were. They were women who never saw a problem that they didn't think could be solved. Of course, I was also reading Nancy Drew, another great problem solver. I bet lots of you were too. They understood that ministering to the suffering and the afflicted was nice but insufficient. To really make a difference, you had to attack the conditions that had brought about that suffering and misery in the first place. And best of all, they weren't terribly beautiful, but they were smart, competent, and courageous. Jane Addams brought social work to the US with Hull House, which she built with her friend Ellen Starr in the slums of Chicago at the end of the 19th century. But she did much more than that. Every progressive movement you can think of, suffrage, civil rights, immigrant rights, children's rights, pacifism, had Jane Addams' fingerprints all over it. And although she looks kind of a dour sort, she actually was a huge fan of play. She built playgrounds in the Hull House complex, and she became an advocate for playgrounds in public spaces all over the country. Most of us think of Florence Nightingale as that lady with the lamp who brought the profession of modern nursing to the US and to England. What you may not know is that she was a fiend for statistics, even one of the first women to use a pie chart. So it was when she returned to England from the Crimea and dug into the data that she realized more soldiers were dying of typhus and cholera and dysentery than from their battle wounds. And that's what led to her breakthrough, that hygiene and sanitation were the key to saving lives. Unlike those wonderful first ladies we saw last night, Eleanor Roosevelt wasn't crazy about the role. So she made sure that kettle of boiling water was always at hand. She was one of the founders of the UN. She chaired the committee that drafted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And she co-founded Freedom House, which continues to monitor the progress and the fits and starts of democracy all over the world. In my opinion, she would have made one heck of a president. Today, I don't have to read about women who lived 50 or 100 years ago to be inspired. I work at the Skoll Foundation with one of the most creative and committed philanthropists of our time, Jeff Skoll, a guy who also believes in the power of stories to shape who we are, what we care about, and what we choose to do with what we care about. My wonderful colleagues and I at the Skoll Foundation seek out and then we invest in, connect, and celebrate the men and women who have made changing the world their life's work. I'd like to tell you about just a couple of them. Cecilia Flores Zabanda grew up in the slums of the Philippines. The second oldest of 12 children, she went to work at the age of five, selling fish and scavenging garbage. I can still feel the warm drippings down my face from the basket of fish I carried on my head, she told me. I can still smell the stench of the garbage in my clothes and on my skin. That's who I am. That's my history. Against powerful odds, Cecilia made it to high school and then to college, where she became an activist. She joined the Maoist rebellion against the Marcos dictatorship. In 1982, she and her husband were imprisoned. They were held for four years. Two of her children were actually born in, in captivity. 
But when the freedom for, what, for, for which she had fought was finally achieved and she was released, she dedicated her life to securing freedom for, whom, for those whom the fledgling state could not yet protect victims of human trafficking. So how would a Maoist rebel bred in the slums attack the very ugly and very big business of human trafficking? By thinking the system through. That's how. Cecilia understood, again, you have to get to the enabling conditions. So she's reached out to the ports, the airports, the shipping companies, the container companies, the bus companies. She's made human trafficking everyone's problem. And so she's helped make it everyone's solution. Ports in the Philippines that were once safe harbors for human traffickers are today becoming havens of hope for victims. From the Philippines of today, we go back in time and space to South Wales, coal country, where Ann Cotton's grandmother left school at the age of 12 after her father was injured in a coal mining accident. This made Anne's grandmother a fierce advocate for, for education, understanding that education was the way out of a life of exploitation and danger. So that when Anne won a scholarship to the best school, the best private school in the region at the age of 11, she understood the opportunity she'd been afforded. At the same time, even at that age, she firmly rejected any correlation between wealth and human value. Years later, she found herself in Zimbabwe. She was carrying out research designed to uncover the cultural reasons so few girls were enrolled in education. What she confronted instead was the stark reality. It's poverty and not culture that's responsible. She returned home to Cambridge, England, and launched CampFed, the Campaign for Female Education, not with a grand strategic plan, but with a bake sale. Now, I find this all the more remarkable, Fiona, you'll agree, because I know Ann Cotton, and she's no baker. <laughs> <laughs> but from that bake sale, from those tea biscuits and cakes, came an organization that today has provided educational opportunity for more than a million girls in sub-Saharan Africa. You know the data. There is nothing, absolutely nothing, that makes as much of a difference to so many every place in the world as an investment in girls' education. But CampFed isn't just any bleeding heart campaign. CampFed, Anne's approach, turns noblesse oblige on its head. It puts the girl client at the center of a power structure made up of locally fully empowered committees working at the district, the regional, and the national level. It's a governance system that is all about accountability, the only accountability that matters to that girl for her education and for her protection so that she can go just as far as she wants. Every Zambian, Kwacha, every Zimbabwean dollar, every British pound that flows through CAMFED can be tracked and traced to that girl client. Two years after that first bake sale, Zimbabwe was able to announce to the 21 districts in the country that scholarships would be available for top scoring applicants. One of those applicants was Runyararo Mashingadze. Here's what she wrote. I used to go to school barefooted, my face full of hunger. If only I get the chance, I will do something great. Today, Runyararo is a pediatrician practicing in Namibia, and there's no question, she's doing something great. If I had the chance, I would tell you many, many more stories about women like Cecilia and Anne, and Elizabeth, and Jacqueline, and Sakina, and Mabel, and so many of the wonderful people in this room, women who've paved the way to change, women social entrepreneurs, women who understand that it's not what you do, it's how you do it. They understand it's not how big you are, how big your budget is, 
how large your organization is, it's how big a difference you can make. Who understand it's not about being dominant in any space or place, it's about crossing boundaries to forge the connections you need to get the job done. It's not how powerful you are, it's about how truly and honestly you empower others. It's been 50 years since I put down Sleeping Beauty, since I woke to discover the power of real women and their stories, women making change in the world. Today, I can imagine my little granddaughter, who's just taken her first steps, striding into the life that she's meant to lead, the life that will draw inspirations from the heroines of our time, the women and men who are building a better world for her. Women and men who understand that who they are says everything about how they do the work they do, that who they are and how they do it are more important than what they do and why they do it. Women who summon the heroine. We are in a time that needs heroines. We need heroes, we need heroines. But we can summon this in each of us. Joseph Campbell said it best, heroism is a matter of integrity, becoming more and more at each step ourselves. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie.